Matt Odette, are you with us? There we go. Unmute the mic. Excellent. Can so we're going to go from um, combustion engines to constructing inside of a building, or maybe actually you're building the, the building as you live it. So I'll thank you so much for, for taking the time there. Covered an incredible amount of ground, and we're going to um, perform sort of a paradigm shift here to a different part of the country and uh, uh, of the world, really, and of thinking about uh, how to make a difference, not only in one place, not only with one set of technologies, but basically with all of them. Um, and moving, it should be mentioned, to another alum of Colonel Lyons's, uh, and the work that he's doing in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you uh, Captain Matt Audette, United States Marines. Excellent, do, we, do I have the baton? Wonderful, uh, appreciate it, John. Uh, thanks everybody for setting this up. Uh, first of all, a couple caveats. Um, I am out on my back porch because I got a, I got a town home and a one-year-old who's taking a nap and my voice carries throughout the house. So uh, birds are surprisingly loud. I apologize in advance. And uh, if something happens like the AC kicks on or y'all can't hear me, can somebody just cut, cut in and, uh, and we'll, we'll go from there. Um, so right quick, uh, sorry to talk mostly slides, but uh, what, I'm, I'm, what I'm talking about does convey better with pictures. So I'm gonna screen share right quick. I can, uh, All set. Excellent. So uh, what I'm going to cover today is pretty much the Marine Corps efforts uh, here to date with uh, additive or advanced manufacturing. Uh, a disclaimer, a bulk of this will be additive manufacturing because it is what we are most comfortable with and it's the uh, easiest bite to take of that fairly large pie. Uh, I'm also going to talk, why are we doing it? How does it fit into the innovation? Uh, how does it fit into the innovation spectrum? And then where are we going with it in the future? Now, uh, I, I'm going to cover about 10 topics. Uh, each one of these could be like an hour long discussion. So it's going to be very quick, very wave tops. Uh, if there are, if you have follow up questions on things like the policy, the IP questions, printer questions, uh, the efforts that we're doing, please reach out. Um, so uh, we do have a 24 seven 3D printing help desk. And then I know my, my information will be in the, uh, the after action. So please track us down. We are, we are here to help. Um, Matt, if I may interject just very briefly, a, a reminder for everybody that the, uh, the chat boxes, anything you want to put there, you're welcome to do so. The Q and A box, I'm able to keep an eye on as the, uh, the facilitator here. So if you put something in there, I'll uh, do my best to hit it in real time. Uh, or really to give Matt the opportunity to do that. And one more reminder for everybody that we are, as ever, on social media rules. So no CUI, no FOUO, and just trying to do our best to be good uh, dudes and dudettes about the rules here. Matt, thank you so much. Back to you, brother. Excellent. I appreciate it. And uh, with my screen share, I cannot see the chat box. So if you see something pertinent popping up, please, please interject. All right. Uh, so quick level setting. Uh, who are we, what do we do? Uh, we are at Marine Corps Systems Command. Uh, this is, we're located in Quantico, Virginia. This is the Department of the Navy Systems Command for Marine Corps Ground Weapon and Information Technology Systems. Uh, so everything that I'm speaking about pertains to ground equipment within the Marine Corps. Uh, now there is, everything that we do is paralleled by, on the aviation side of the Marine Corps by Nav Air, but those are paid for by Navy dollars, so they have their own rules with respect to their concerns with implementing additive or advanced manufactured parts. Uh, but just everything that I'm saying, there's a, there's a parallel effort and they're every, every bit as agile as we are. Uh, they definitely have my respect. So my team is called the Advanced Manufacturing Operations Cell. Uh, it was established in January 2019. Uh, it falls under the Syscom G3. Uh, what, what we are not is a program office. Uh, what we are is both fleet and program office facing resources for everybody to tap into. Uh, we are a central stable of technical experts who are staffed and resourced to help others to explore advanced manufacturing solutions. Uh, like I said, a bulk of what we do is 3D printing. There's going to be a very heavy 3D printing flavor to this, uh, but we also deal in traditional manufacturing. Uh, very Every once in a while we stray into circuitry. So, like I said, we're both the technical we're technical experts for both the fleet and the program offices. Most people do not have a deep expertise on AM, so we're their on-call nerds. 
Uh, we maintain active relationships with the labs up at Naval Service Warfare Center Carter Rock. Uh, they are absolute rock stars and also Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab and GTRI. So if needed, we can throw real engineering and scientific rigor behind the analysis of AM solutions. Uh, in addition, we are the ones who monitor and manage the current digital repository for the Marine Corps AM parts. Uh, if anybody's familiar with 3D printing and Thingiverse, Marine Corps has its own Thingiverse page. Uh, we are the ones that monitor that. This allows for a fleet-wide collaboration and shared design. So it's one of those things where if a Marine in Lejeune decides a part, now Marines out in Okinawa or Kuwait can utilize that, print them, and start hanging them on gear. We also manage the AM part approval pipeline. Uh, so say a Marine in the fleet designs a part. Is this good? Is it bad? Do the, what, what are the effects on the gear? Uh, so one of the functions we serve is they submit it to us via the repository, and we get it in front of the program office engineers. So the engineers can go through and start chewing on it. And then from there, we work to get to yes. It's uh, what concerns do you have before you adopt this part? What, what would you like to see? What data do you need to see? What risks do you, do you foresee to gear upstream and downstream of, of the AM part? And then from there, we work to yes. Uh, we do not always get to yes, but a lot of times we get to yes, but. Um, and I can talk to specifics on, on yes, buts all day. Uh, another one of our supporting roles is we manage the 24-7 3D printing help desk. Uh, you can email us at parts underscore help desk at usmc.mil. Uh, we've also got a phone line I'll put out there. Now, that does go to the Syscom officer of the day. If you call that at 2 in the morning, you will no longer get me. You will get the Syscom OOD because I was getting calls at 2 in the morning for people check, kicking the tires on, hey, is this actually 24 hours? Um, so we provide advanced manufacturing rapid fabrication support to help solve readiness issues and implement novel solutions. Uh, by us being at MarCorps Syscom, where all the ground equipment in the Marine Corps is fielded from, uh, when there's a readiness issue, folks eventually get pointed to us, and then we can go and grab the program office engineers, and we can all come together and start grinding on potential solutions, and then how we can disseminate them throughout the fleet. All right, and then one of the other things we do on that, uh, Third bullet point is we evaluate advanced manufacturing technologies uh, and conduct prototyping experiments. Uh, we look for chances to advance the state of the art in battlefield AM. What are the places that industry is not leaning towards, throwing their massive amount of R&D dollars for? What are our niche cases, uh, use cases with respect to being the Marine Corps? And how can we move that forward so that it benefits us better? Uh, so, Big question is, uh, why, are, why are we making this investment in 3D printing? And uh, why of all people is the Marine Corps doing this? Uh, we have a reputation of being the Luddites of the family tree. And uh, I'd argue in some cases that is very much deserved. But for us, we're, we're moving very quickly with this. And the, uh, the adoption on, of this capability has been faster and uh, had better top cover leadership, I'd say, than, than other places. So why the Marine Corps? Uh, first of all, with the Army, the Army has a massive industrial base. They also have great in-house manufacturing capability and R&D capability. That is a huge center of gravity that us as the Marine Corps simply do not have. Uh, we do not have an ARL that we can reach out to. We do not have a Picatinny arsenal. We do not have, and so we're also the secondary of most of the gear that we buy. So we buy smaller numbers, therefore we tend to end up at the, at the back of the table. And for the Air Force, if something goes wrong on a, on a printed part, if it goes wrong, it falls out of the sky. That's a huge concern. And in the Navy, it either will sink to the bottom of the ocean or fall out of the sky and then sink to the bottom of the ocean. Those are huge concerns. Uh, those are very real and legitimate concerns that us as the Marine Corps Ground Equipment Command, we are not encumbered with those. So in my opinion, we have a responsibility to move fast because we have lower risk if something goes wrong. Uh, on top of that, our culture makes us much less risk averse than our sister branches. Uh, this is, again, the center of gravity of the Marine Corps is the individual Marine and their bias for action and their willingness to accept risk based on ground truth of the situation. And so, and on, on top of all the, those other points, most of our gear is broken, so God damn it, we might as well try. So that first bullet point, what are we doing with 3D printing? We intend to exploit AM to the maximum extent to reduce maintenance cycle times, decrease supply chain backlogs, enable novel solutions, and place manufacturing capabilities at or near the point of need. So 
those are those are pretty much uniform across all the services. You'll you'll see that as why is everybody 3D printing to address diminishing sources of supply, make a more agile logistics chain. Everybody's doing that. Um, what where we are deviating from everybody else is where and who will be printing, uh, and the the reason for that is expeditionary advanced base operations. So with conflict going forward, we've been told that we need to seek the affordable and plentiful at uh, at the expense of the exquisite. So that, that's that's our guiding light. And then also with expeditionary advanced base operations, what it's calling for is small, highly mobile detachments of Marines to maneuver along among island chains, set up, execute a mission, and then pack up and leave before being detected and targeted. The older model of landing teams was based on the BLT. You're looking at a thousand plus Marines and all their gear going ashore. And while we're still working on what the exact laydown of this gear will be, who is going, and the numbers, we know that it's going to be smaller by an order of magnitude or more. And so, and also in this denied environment where network connectivity is, it is a vulnerability. Uh, resupplying an expeditionary advanced base is also going to be forecasting where your forces are and incur risk by sending in resupply. And what that means is where we are going, there is no supply chain. So it's not a, it's not a short supply chain, it's just there, there is none. So I need a capability to produce something on demand, on site, and that solution just needs, just needs to let me home. I do not care what this does at 5,000 hours. I don't care what it does at 250 hours. I need to get off the island. And so when you're on that island, that class nine block of your repair parts, that physical class nine block, that is a finite amount of space and weight. And so what we wanna do is supplement that with a digital class nine block. So if I can bring a hard drive with as many advanced manufacturing repair parts files as I can, and a suite of generalist machines, to produce the part on site, that right there is what we need because two things are certain on expeditionary advanced base. Things will go wrong, unforeseen problems will arise and gear will break. Like those, those two things, we know it is gonna happen. And we have people in the Marine Corps who make parts, our machinists, our 2161s. I'm very much tied into this community. I'm a great admirer of them, but there's 140 of them in the entire Marine Corps. So what I need is, it, it also takes, months to learn how to operate the equipment and years to master it. And that's something I don't have. I need to be able to, I need to be a technician, push button, receive part, or in some cases have enough, have enough CAD and 3D printing knowledge baked into Marines of every MOS to where they can go through and affect material solutions on the spot on demand, because not every problem is going to look like a repair part. That novel solution, that MacGyver solution is going to be more valuable in certain cases than the repair parts. All right, so that was why are we doing it? So where are we now? Uh, what have we done? Uh, we've been doing this for three years, and what has it gotten us? Uh, the most important piece of this puzzle is the policy. The current rules of the road is MAR Admin 594-TAC-17. That currently tells you who can print and what you can print. Uh, from there, we go, we have laid out what you can and can't print, and it's all based on risk. And who accepts that risk is that O5 commander. So broad categories based on risk, green, yellow, red. Green is low risk, yellow is medium, red high. And it's all done by consequences in case of failure. Obviously the green being low, if the part is low risk, if, if it does fail, nobody will get hurt. No gear will get broken. And we've got a bunch of other categories like training aids, tooling, jigs, facilities items. Why would you need to ask? And the policy says you don't need to ask. You just go. Uh, for yellow and red, those medium and high risks, the authority to hang the part, the onus has been put on the O5 commanders, not the program office engineers. And the reason for that, that was a very deliberate decision on our part, is because while the program office engineers might have all the technical information, those O5 commanders have situational awareness on the ground. Uh, so I, I've made this argument before. If we do not trust our O5 commanders to make AM decisions, that's that. Those O5 commanders make life and death decisions in combat and in training. Why cannot they do? Why can they not do it with maintenance? If we don't trust them with 3D printed parts, that's not a 3D printing problem. That's a manpower problem. So now 
if that commander wants to see hard numbers to inform their risk decision, they can reach back to my cell and we'll put them in contact with the program office. We'll go through and we'll get, we will find data to help them make that better decision. So they're not flying blind. Uh, we do, we have had this happen before in the past where program office, AMOC, Georgia Tech Research Institute and a commander all, we all sit down and we grind on a problem and we come to different conclusions on where does it, what is the usability of this part, but the O5 commander is the final decision. And we gave them data, uh, they assessed it, they hang the parts. We have a forthcoming Marine Corps order that is wrapped up uh, the last three years of lessons learned, uh, and it should be out within the next two months. We have established a repository for our Marines to hang parts on. Now, this is the safety backstop to all those green bin parts. Uh, so we have in our policy is if a Marine designs a part that is to be 3D printed or advanced manufactured, they need to hang it on the repository. Now, this is the safety backstop. Uh, myself and my team, we check this repository every morning and every night for new parts that are uploaded, just to make sure nobody goes high and right. Uh, a lot of people like to paint the picture of, well, the, the Marines are gonna go through and try to print a Humvee engine block and they're gonna put the whole battalion in the Humvee and everybody's gonna die a fiery death. No, no, and trends, trends on my side of the Marines tend to err more cautious than, than they are more adventurous with it. But we are the safety backstop in case someone does stray, we do have eyes on it. That current repository is over 400 parts uh, that were crowdsourced from Marines in the fleet. And that is also where you find that part approval pipeline I spoke about before. So for printers, uh, who gets them? And well, the answer for that is everybody. So we have north of 300 printers out in the fleet. Most of them are consumer grade desktops. If anybody's familiar with the Lulzbot TAS-6, that is our workhorse. We have a lot of those out in the fleet. Now there are a couple of different ways to get printers. Uh, we have programs of record and non-programs of record. And again, the way we handled this was critical to us gaining a lot of momentum very early on. So we have two established programs of record in the Marine Corps for 3D printers. Uh, uh, engineer goes, teaches all the Marines uh, how to do it. It is an operator level maintenance. Matt, I think we're having some contact in, con connectivity issues here. Give your uh, audio a couple seconds to sync back up. Um, in the meantime, I'm looking down the list here and I can see a few questions queued up. Uh, Gina, I see yours. Charlie, I see yours. Anybody else you want to throw it in? We'll make sure we get a chance to uh, kick it to Matt uh, before we roll on too much farther. Uh, if we don't have Matt in uh, more than a couple seconds here, we'll probably uh, roll into an intermission. Uh, Hey, can you all hear me? Yep, we got you back. You okay, good? there we go. We good? Name hey, Charlie. Excellent, excellent. All right, so uh, missed where I cut off, so I'll back up a little bit. Two programs of record. Uh, one of them is aimed at operator level units. Uh, it's two, two commercial grade 3D printers in Pelican cases going out to essentially every, every time in the Marine Corps is the intent. And then the next one is uh, for the intermediate level. Uh, it's a mobile shelter with production grade machines capable of more engineering grade materials, higher tolerances, higher throughput. Uh, and those are intended to go any place where you'll find machinists in the fleet. Now, how we got to 300 printers out in the fleet is by, we've got a lot of questions is, hey, how do you, how do you get a 3D printer as a, as a unit within the Marine Corps? And the answer is we put them on ServMark. You can buy the exact same printers we put in that in the TAC fab. You can buy them on ServMart. We've made it to where if a commander wants to go out and open purchase their own printer, absolutely. You have the green light to go and start to experiment and ideate and work on ad adopting this innovative technology. Uh, and because of that, we have commanders that have leaned into it very heavily, Vice wanting to wait the two years for the program of record. So, our focus areas for the AMOC, we've been working on a standardizing the part approval process. Uh, we work a lot with program office engineers to educate them on 3D printing capabilities and limitations and work with them to address the cons their concerns they have before adopting a part and approving it. And then we pass those along to the fleet. Like I said, we get, we get yeses, but then we also get a lot of yes buts in order to inform the 05 commander's decision. 
Uh, they typically look like things like, yes, but we don't know what it's going to look like in six months. So please let us know in six months. Yes, but when this breaks, you need to let us know so we have a rough idea of, of what time uh, this part is good for. Because there's a lot of unknowns. But what we push for is not waiting until all the knowns are known before making a decision, but also being able to ideate and implement in a controlled, responsible manner. So uh, like, like I said before, the, the program manager is the approval authority. Uh, so they, they can approve a part, but that 05 commander and above is the approval authority for using them. An 05 commander does not ha have to wait for program office approval before making the decision that it is higher risk for me to not have this part. Uh, and technical data is a big topic. Uh, going through and scrubbing, what do we currently own and where is it? Uh, and also trying to, what can we give the fleet users access to based on what government rights do we have? Uh, is, it, is, it on a, is it on a computer uh, is uh, something that we found that we have to ask. So going forward, one of the things we're finding with technical data is we cannot afford to buy everything. We, we simply can't. And uh, the vast majority of it is not useful. And one of the things that I push the program offices to do is not everybody thinks, oh, we need to buy the CAD files. We want to buy the CAD files. We want to buy the CAD files. And that is, we have found through some hard trial and error that that is not the route that we want to go. Uh, because in order to make take a traditionally manufactured part and make it acceptable for 3D printing or some other means of manufacturing that it wasn't originally designed for, 90% of the time there's a geometry change. So that CAD model that we would pay money for is not very useful, useful because we'd have to go through and modify it anyway. What we want from the OEMs is we want to be able to purchase what standards did they test to? What numbers did the OEM come to when testing this individual part? Because we test our vehicles as systems. I don't know what every bracket on the seven ton, what the failure, uh, what the failure point is on it. I just know that if I go through the, the course at Aberdeen Test Ground, the brackets don't break. And so now we're having to ask new questions to OEMs like, hey, this individual bracket, you have data on it. Can we buy it? Can we have a royalty fee on it? Because one of the things we want to make absolutely clear is we are not trying to cut the business end out of this. I do not want the Marine Corps 2BA source of supply, and we are not interested in being a manufacturing house. We just need to be able to fix our gear now in an austere environment is what we're after. We are more than happy to pay you for the tech data. So that's that's something that we cannot reiterate enough. Uh, so intellectual property. We want to make sure that we aren't stealing our vendor's IP and that we're addressing any of those concerns. And primarily, this is a big education piece. Uh, we have a badass IP lawyer on our team. One of the best ones, I'd argue, that he is the best one in the DoD. And one of the big things that we make sure that our vendors know is, like I said, we're not interested in becoming a manufacturing house. It, it just please work with us and where we can. We are we are very interested in paying you for your intellectual property. And then the safety testing and material characterization of parts. And a lot of this is being done on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, the folks at Carter Rock are working very diligently with NAVC to try to go through and have safety testing material characterizations be done on a machine-by-machine -machine basis instead of a part-by-part -part basis. All right, so training. Uh, this is the part I am passionate about. So who in the Marine Corps do we want to be 3D printing? Who learns, who learns AM? And the answer is everyone, every single MOS, because the barrier to entry to producing a prototype through 3D printing is a handful of hours. And getting smart on CAD is a handful of hours. And so what this means is you can bring the full context of your MOS field and have the added benefit of now you can be an active part of the material solution. You can make parts while still knowing the ins and outs of being a generator mechanic. You can make parts while still being knowledgeable on how to be a rifleman. What I am not interested in is having an MOS where all you do is 3D print. We have people that make parts. What if, this, if we had a primary MOS of you only 3D print, you're a worse machinist. But what you need is the context. And so I can, and what the advantage of this is the final answer, if the final answer goes beyond what you can do on your desktop, uh, 3D printing, 3D printer, that CAD file that you developed, can be transferred laterally to people like machinists. They can be given over to OEMs to do mass production. So you don't have to be the one to produce it, but you can inform the decision. Uh, we see a lot of things that the PQDRs, the NAVMAC 10772s that go to the program offices, a lot of the low hanging fruit that doesn't get handled because of man hours can be pushed to the Marines to solve. Uh, so like if anybody saw on the front page of the Marine Corps Times, that Sattler mic cover clip, 
program office knew about that. They had the, the PQDRs in, in store for that. But if it comes down to taking their handful of engineers and committing to how do we stop Marines getting shocked when they press the, the button on this mic or better SATCOM for the Marine Corps, they're going to do the SATCOM problem. But that lower hanging fruit, now it can start pushing it to the Marines and crowdsourcing it. So that conversation doesn't start with describe to me the problem. It starts with here's a solution. I've tested it into the field. We think this is ready for the rest of the Marine Corps. We're primarily training in our maker spaces. Uh, so we've got a handful uh, throughout the fleet, and, and I'm establishing three more a year for the next four years. These are our center for developing rapid prototyping and problem solving skills in, in innovating. So this is my learn, teach a man to fish center. So I got mobile training teams, but here are where I want the Marines teaching Marines how to go through and think about technical problem solving skills instead of just doing the Marine Corps thing of, hey, 550 cord duct tape or good. Let's add more tools to the toolbox. Let's add CAD. Let's add 3D printing. Let's add a little bit of code, sensors, circuitry. All right, uh, so again, why are we involving the Marines? Why not focus on the engineers, the program office, the labs, and the depots? Um, and the answer is we, the Marine on the ground, at ground level, has an answer. They are smart. They're far more smarter than a lot of people who have been out of the fleet give them credit for. The good Marines stay up at night and they think about how to improve the process. It, it, you cannot stop them from improving it. So us as leaders, it is on us to enable them to go through and exploit their individual competencies to the maximum capability. We need to provide them the top cover through policy and through culture and just the, the, the green light to go and start making the situation better. So every, every commander knows that as soon as you give a Marine agency over the outcome of a situation, their IQ goes up by 10 points. That is what this is doing. Instead of like, hey, this really sucks. Of course it does. You're a Marine. To exist is to suffer. You deal with it. No. We need to have the conversation starting now that, hey, there's a way to make it better. You have agency over the outcome of the situation. Because going back to the expeditionary advance base, what I cannot have is I cannot have Marines say, hey, I don't touch water purifiers. I'm a calm guy. I do, not touch our, I do not touch artillery units. I'm a grunt. What I need is people that will roll up their sleeves and get in there and try to affect the outcome anyhow because that's how we, that is how we get our success. And these maker spaces are those centers where I am teaching them those technical skills on how to do it, but I'm also giving them permission to go through and start cracking things open and seeing if they can affect the outcome. Uh, I know I'm running short on time, so somebody can reel me in if I'm going over. Let me, uh, Matt, actually, I, I think on that note, let me pose a couple of questions from the audience here. Yeah. Uh, so one, I think this one's easy to hit. It's from Gina, if I'm... Uh, I'm guessing I'm saying this one's from uh, Nywick Pack. Can you make masks in support of COVID-19? We are actively exploring this. Um, so the reason I got a I got a hard stop time is we are we are looking into making these masks. Uh, there's a lot of variables out there, or we are we think we've identified the people who are smart enough. Let me go ahead and drop the screen share so I can answer these questions. I think we found the people who are smart enough to answer the questions of. What type of HEPA filter? How long is the HEPA filter good for? What risks do you incur by going through and putting a non-N95 manufacturer approved mask? And is that worth the risk to you to wear it? Is a 3D printer the right tool for it? Uh, a lot of the plastic we print are rigid. I've seen 3D printed masks out there. Um, I'd argue that, that I, I personally think is a problem that could be solved with a sewing machine, but we are exploring. Uh, we are exploring it. I know uh, Alex Walls and uh, the folks out at Second MLG Makerspace are on there as well. Uh, on our Makerspace sync, we've pretty much everybody came to the conclusion that we have a responsibility as people who can affect change to start implementing solutions. So long answer to we are exploring it as soon as we have something, we'll be pushing it out to everybody. Awesome. Really cool. Uh, and are there any new materials that the Marine Corps is interested in using to increase the strength and rigidity of the standard ABS, nylon, PLA, even if reinforced with shortened carbon fiber? Uh, yes, always. Uh, so there are certain machines can do things like Onyx, uh, Mark Forge's proprietary chopped carbon fiber. Um, we're always interested in that, but I will say that a lot of the material science and the very hard engineering problems are being done by our sister services and their labs. Uh, and so we're mostly working on where we're deviating from everybody else is 
being able to print on the field in the field, have the call or have the training in place, have the gear in place and start training the Marines on it, vice the hard science. Uh, and the answer to that is it's not because we're not interested in it. It's because we don't have the resources to go through and answer those material science questions. Whereas the other, other services are outfitted to do it and we're completely relying on them. Uh, case in point, uh, heard an army two star who's in charge of the, uh, maybe it was an air force two star in charge of the material command. He said he has 800 engineers focused on 3d printing and technical 3d printing problems. I have two. And if I were to go through and extend the net out to the folks at Carter Rock and Johns Hopkins and GTRI, I've probably got access to 40 people. And so I'm not answering those questions, but other people are. And I, and I'm completely reliant on them answering those questions for me. Got it. Makes sense. Uh, which speaking of questions that people are clamoring for answers to, for folks who are interested in getting maker spaces or perhaps just access to 3D printing or advanced manufacturing capabilities, wherever they are across the forest, uh, what's in the works? How do they do that? Yeah, so uh, we have maker spaces on our, the folks out of 2nd MLG, maker space out on French Creek. If you guys are on Lejeune, I got to plug them. Those guys are absolute rock stars. They're running with it uh, and they have damn near infinite amount of top cover from the leadership too. So if you're on Lejeune, the maker space on French Creek is the place to go. We also have them on Pendleton. Uh, we newly established one on Hawaii. Um, there's, I got another one coming to Okinawa and my intent is by the end of this four year time period, I want one on every Marine Corps base or every major cluster of bases. It might not be on say like Geiger versus Lejeune. You might have to do a bit of a commute, but my, my goal is to have us completely canvassed. Beautiful. Other questions from the crowd out here? Let's see what we got. So Matt Murphy is curious how his efforts to integrate with uh, ELA have worked out for you, and how are you co coordinating approaches for common parts or integrating cross-service? One might even ask cross-agency, across government, uh, AM capabilities. Yes. So we are, we're on the phone with ELA's AM team Typically once or twice a week, uh, my, my team's logistician is main task is to integrate with DLA's AM office. Uh, I will say that they've got a very well staffed office and a lot of great ideas. Uh, it's a big ship with a small rudder, but they grind every day to make sure all the services are tied together. Uh, one of the things that we have our repository, every, every service or every syscom or PEO has its own repository based on its own concerns. And one of the great things that DLA is doing is they have a joint, they're working on a joint repository for the, all the services. Uh, so this way, if I have parts that the Army has designed, the Marine Corps has access to them. Uh, if the Air Force is designing parts, the Navy has access to them. So DLA is on board. Uh, they, they talk to all the services very regularly and they've got a, a large number of efforts. They're also tackling the really hard questions with respect to like the supply chain because there is implications with respect to the supply chain. What is, we still have to show demand for these parts somehow. Even if we 3D print a part, we still need to show OEMs that, look, don't, if we're hanging 3D printed parts, the, a lot of people are concerned that the demand will go down and OEMs will start making them and then we'll paint ourselves into a corner. DLA is tackling problems like that. How do you categorize uh, AM parts? And they're also, they have uh, test cells. So if we go through and we have parts that we want to validate, uh, DLA has labs and engineers that can go through and give us numbers in addition to our own resources. Very cool. Uh, another one here. What type of facility requirements are associated with maker spaces? Exhaust fans, ventilation, do you need to send prayers up to heaven? Yeah, so, so we will tailor it based on your facility's needs. So typically find we do need about 16 outlets. We try to run everything just off of basic wall warts. Now, if you can support things like ventilation, that's where we can start looking at putting in other tools like a laser cutter, which does require ventilation. Um, but we will tailor it to each specific space based on what the command who's receiving the maker space can get us. Because sometimes it's uh, sometimes it is a room at the bottom of barracks. Other times it's a very dedicated, very uh, new. Uh, a new space that was built, you know, with, within this century, but we work with what we're given. Well, where you're planted, make it work. That's right. Figure it out. Yeah, that's, right. that's awesome. Um, okay, looking back at the uh, questions queue here, I think we got the last one. Unless there are any saved rounds from those assembled, I'm going to give you about 30 seconds to throw stuff up on there. Matt, uh, as you think, I, 
I'm prepared to argue. I don't think that there would be a whole lot of uh, uh, disagreement on this point, but there's basically nobody in the armed forces who knows like an order of magnitude more about advanced manufacturing than you do. So I, I as you think it. about, you know, you don't need to dispute that. I know you would, I know you would. Uh, but as you think about where the force is headed and, um, you know, in keeping with your ideas about how everybody needs to have some basic, you know, conversational capability, if not fluency in this stuff, what sort of parting thoughts would you leave us with as we think about how to take advantage of these solutions over the, the coming years? I cannot, I cannot emphasize the importance of people in the leadership position making it known that they're giving the green light for people to take risks. The number one thing that I, we get back from, from people at ground level, we talk to them is they go, oh, I don't think my commander will be on board with this. Uh, and so I, I make a very strong argument that no good Marine has ever been held up by paperwork or policy. They will, they will do what they determine is right. And so a lot of the Marines you know, was like, hey, what's your commander think about this? I didn't ask him. I just went. But then we also hear plenty of people who are very timid about it. And I'd say that just having the leadership go through and say, hey, I think this is a good idea. I think we need to start adopting this mindset, if not necessarily the technology, because you don't need a 3D printer to go through and, and start affecting change. That's the most critical piece of this. You know, I didn't expect this to be the case, but at some level, the theme of the day around connectedness is trust. Yeah, that's, that's it. And also knowing that they have a, a fenced in area to where if, if something goes wrong, they're, they're not going to get gig for it. That, that, Hey, we're, we are learning this in garrison uh, and trying to, trying to make people understand that people will say like, Hey, why are we 3d printing this part? There's a lot of them in the supply chain. It's like, of course, but I, I just yeah. want one. I want to print one. I want to test it. So that way we're not going through and we can either start learning this now and becoming comfortable with this risk taking now and the technological capability, or we can start trying to learn it after the balloon goes up. So it's early yeah. is the time to learn. That's right. The more we sweat in peace, et cetera. That's it. Matt, thank you so much for taking time with us today. If you have a moment before you hop off, there's one question pending for you in the Q&A, and you can just tap out a text answer for that one. I yeah, sounds good. You're champion. Thank you, Brian. Okay, appreciate it, everybody.